Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. Some lucky people have visited tropical countries, and most of us have seen pictures of the lush growth and beautiful flowers and plants from that region of the world. While we may not be able to travel to the tropical countries, we can let part of the tropics come to us. Come along with us today as Prairie Yard and Garden visits the tropics here in the Upper Midwest. I do pretty well with winter until after Christmas. In the last three months of the year, I'm busy wrapping up the gardening season and preparing for the holidays. Then January arrives and the cold and the snow have me dreaming about warm, sunny days, flowers, and tropical plants. Today, Suzette Nordstrom of Monrovia is going to help us discover the year-round beauty of tropicals. Welcome, Suzette. Hey, thank you for having me. It was worth the drive to come from Minneapolis to see all this color. Tell me exactly and tell all of us exactly what are tropicals? Well, I think people sometimes get confused when they hear the word tropical. But basically, in a nutshell, what a tropical is, is those are the plants that are not winter hardy to plants zone five and below. So it's plants that at the end of the season, they're not going to make it through. They're just, they're there to be used for that seasonal color up until the winter starts to come. What makes them unique? Oh, the best part about tropicals is tropical plants are things like mandevillas, bananas, hibiscus, and they give you all this really great colored foliage and textures, and you get different colors of flowers. I mean, annuals are great, and these are great contrasting things to use in your patio, pots, containers, to give you an extra wow and a punch for the season. Okay, you mentioned that, um... Uh, that they, you can get some that are flowering and some that have beautiful foliage, but um, you know, tell us how people would use these tropical plants. Well, I think we've got a lot of really good examples and here at Morse they have lots of, they have this cool Monrovia tropical garden where it shows them all planted together. But tropicals can be used in your patio planters just like you would plant a marigold or certain varieties like a plumbago would work in a hanging basket. And I think people sometimes get in the mindset that if you're using a tropical plant, it has to go in a container, but it doesn't. You know, you can plant them in the ground. You see them at golf courses. You see them at arboretums. If you go to Chicago on the Miracle Mile, there's purple fountain grass planted for blocks. It's fun to see all these different uses for tropicals. Oh, so purple fountain grass would be considered a tropical. It is, and a lot of people get confused because they see it all red and beautiful and spiky, but they assume it's hardy because it's in the ground. No, not at all. It's no different than planting, you know, impatience, marigolds. It just gives you a bigger, bolder, strappier type plant. Oh, I love to see that in a container because it just adds so much texture and interest. And, and in the fall, it's gorgeous, too. Um, uh, it just seems like it, you can use it for so many things. Well, and that's the hardest part is that you, you get these plants in the spring. We go through this winter where we're all dormant for so long. Then all of a sudden we see all these beautiful plants that arrive at the garden center and you take home a banana that's this tall and then by the fall or the end of the season it could be six, seven, eight feet tall. And that's when we have to decide what are we going to do with these plants. But the tropicals are great because they will go from our spring season all the way up until we hit about 40 degrees. And then that's when we have to start thinking about what we're going to do with them. How should a person care for the tropicals? So because they're trying to grow and push so fast, 
and they have so many flowers, you got to make sure that they're heavily fed. You know, there's those three numbers on the fertilizer bottles, you know, and you always want that middle number to be a higher number because that what gives you all your bloom power. But you want to make sure that most tropicals need to stay more moist than dry, and you, you just want to make sure that you give them that extra jag of fertilizer because it really helps them to bloom and just look just like this, just beautiful. If you have a fertilizer that even is considered like a blossom booster, that would be a good variety or a good type to use. It's perfect. So I always tell people when they're buying tropicals, before you leave a garden center, grab a bottle of bloom booster or whatever your favorite product is because that's something that that plant is going to need to keep it going throughout the season. And I bet you since they are used to growing in a tropical, more moist atmosphere, you would need to make sure that they don't dry out. Oh, that's the biggest thing that people will do is that they grow so fast in the container that you always want to make sure that when you buy those tropicals that you either put them in a bigger pot or loosen up that soil around them so that plant can take off and flourish. And you do want to make sure that you never let them dry out. I mean, you think that some of these plants come from Arizona, Florida, but you want to make sure that you constantly keep them moist because once they dry out, that's when the foliage can get crispy, a bloom can go bad, and you want them to be at their ultimate peak all throughout the summer. Well, I could see, um, you know, that there's uh, so many uses for them, but I bet you that they, especially the ones that have uh, pretty foliage or beautiful blooms, how nice that they would be if you use them on your porch as a welcoming thing mm -hmm. or on your patio if you're sitting out and enjoying that. And um, so many people have these outdoor rooms now that have become so popular. So Well, and that's what's so great about them. I mean, we have an example over here we'll show later of a mandevilla climbing up on a trellis. You know, or maybe you have a ginger that greets you in a shady spot going into your house. And some of the tropicals are fragrance, like gardenias. I mean, I make sure every year I have a gardenia or a jasmine on my deck. So at night when the mosquitoes go down, I'm out there and my plant is, we're still 90 at night. And you have that humidity and you can smell that sweet smell. It's awesome. Now, you had mentioned that they are not hardy for here. Nope. What do you do with them in the fall? Well, there's a couple tricks that you can do with tropicals. I mean, some people think, oh my gosh, I'm spending so much money on this plant. I want to try to keep it through the winter. But really, it's no different than buying a hanging basket or a pot, a geranium tub. Some plants just will not make it through the winter. And some you just need to compost them and start again next year. But there are some types of tropicals that you can winter successfully indoors. And kind of that magic temperature number is like we talked about earlier, 40 degrees. So when our night temps start to settle in that 40 degree range, that's when we have to think about, are we going to overwinter this plant or are we going to send it to the compost pile? And if it is a plant we're going to bring into our home, there's a couple ways you can overwinter them. But the main things you got to do is, since you're going to be moving it inside, you're going to back off the water. You're going to back off the food, because right now we're trying to slow this plant down, not accelerate it. And then you always want to cut it back a third. And that's probably the hardest thing for homeowners to do, because, you know, they're looking at their banana that's now seven feet tall, and they're saying, oh, we got to go ahead and we got to cut this thing back. But you got to slow them down. And then in a, inside, you can have some of them that do well in a bright, sunny spot, or some that you just let go dormant, and then you bring them back up again in February and start getting more sun. A trick that we always use at garden centers, or I always help you know my neighbor ladies with, is if a plant has a thick, fleshy leaf, kind of like a hibiscus or some of those, those are more easy to winter in, indoors. But if it has a fuzzy leaf, those are sometimes the ones that you just have to compost, because they're going to have so much trouble for you indoors that it's, it's really not worth it and you should just let them go. Do you have to um, acclimate them to your indoor uh, area because there'll be lower humidity in there at all? Well, or? there's certain plants that are more susceptible to humidity. A perfect example is the gardenia we talked about earlier. Gardenias like to be really humid and our winters, you know, we get so dry in our houses. And so what you can do as a trick is sometimes you can take a saucer and put little pebbles on it, then put your plant on top of it that way the water doesn't sit on the bottom of that pot, but it allows kind of a little bit of a, puts a little more humidity around that. And other tricks for indoors is make sure your plants don't sit by the vents on the floor. Make sure they're not pushed up against a glass window where the temperatures can fluctuate. I mean, just little things like that make a big difference. Where can uh, people buy these tropical plants? I mean, you, your company obviously produces them and ships them, but where can people find them to buy them? Well, Monrovia is one of the largest container producers of 
nursery stock in the United States. We have four growing locations. So the plants that we ship into this market come from Georgia, California, and that's where most of the tropicals come from. There's two ways to find our plants easily, is you can go on to monrovia.com, and we have a dealer locator where you can actually type in your zip code. You could do this in the winter. You could be sitting in Morris and put in your zip code and it'll tell you all the garden centers that carry our plants. Or we've added one more step this year, which is called shopmonrovia.com, where say that you have a garden center you like to shop at, they don't carry a certain color of bougainvillea. You can go on our website, order that plant, pay for it you know, in February, and then it'll be shipped to your local garden center that you choose in the spring. It's a great program. And it allows all these weird, kitschy plants that people love to be able to find them. Would you be willing to show us some of the plants in oh, detail? Yes, for sure. We have great stuff here at the gardens. Oh my gosh, we have so many good choices for people that want to start with tropicals. This first one here is Lantana, and we talked about it a little bit earlier. See how it has a trunk? So it's got like a, pa a patio tree or a lollipop type. A plant like this, before we ship it, is about two years old. So it's kind of a senior citizen in the tropical world, but we love them. And what's great about Lantana is some people love the smell, take a whiff, and some people hate the smell. But I think they smell real earthy and organic, and they're great for attracting hummingbirds and butterflies in your garden. This is one of the tropicals that needs really hot sun, and the more sun we get and the hotter we get, the better they perform. The other thing that we have here in the Midwest is wind. And people always say, well, what's not going to blow apart on my deck? And this is the plant for you. Lantanas come in multiple colors. There's pinks, yellows, reds. I make sure every year I have a lantana on my deck. I love them. Do you think it's this beautiful smell or this, well, I like the smell, <laughs> that that attracts the hummingbirds and the butterflies? You know, a lot of times with hummingbirds and butterflies, it's places where they can sit and with butterflies where they can sunbathe, where they can sit and open up their wings and absorb the heat. And so that's where these are good places to land. And they're also, they're heavy plants for pollinators. So that's why it's bringing hummingbirds, bees. But yeah, I, well, the one on my deck, it's constantly has traffic on it from all kinds of, you know, hummingbirds and butterflies. The neat thing about this is you have multiple colors on the same plant. Oh, yeah. So you can use this uh, no matter what your scheme is. I mean, you can include this and it'll still blend in with so many different plants too. And because it is planted as it is, um, this is probably one that you could put other plants down on the bottom in a big pot with it. Oh, for sure. And sometimes people will get scared about how do you put colors together. And it's kind of a great rule of thumb that you just gotta know if the plant takes sun or takes shade. And then what you put around the base has to have those same light or sun characteristics and there's really no right or wrong. So perhaps you wanna stick with pastels, perhaps you wanna bring in blue or perhaps you wanna do vibrant. No right or wrong, just make sure that they all have the same light requirements. And then this beauty <laughs> here. Okay, well I love this plant and this one is one that is probably the most heavily used tropical in Minnesota and it's purple fountain grass. And purple fountain grass, sometimes you'll see them in the garden centers in spring. And the blades on the grass are kind of green. They're not really purple. But what happens is as the temperature gets hotter and we get more length of day during the summer, then the leaves get purpler and purpler. So sometimes you buy them and they're kind of green. But once we get hot, they start to turn purple. The other thing that's cool about purple fountain grass is they get these wavy seed, seed tops on them. And I, even though this plant is really hard to overwinter, and at the end you should probably just compost it, I always leave these in my pots during the winter, just because I love to have this texture until they get blown away by a blizzard. But they're so pretty, and this is about max height right here. And these, when I have these, I use these in my pots at home too, and I, I love them for the foliage in the summer. And then in the fall, when my other plants oh, start yeah. to get really tired, yep, <laughs> that's a good word for it. Um, I'll pull those out and then lay pumpkins down oh, around yeah, the bottom of the trip. gourds. And, and the coloring is absolutely beautiful, even with pumpkins or the, the fall decorating things that we use. So well, just look at here at this spot right here at the garden where we have the yellow canna over here contrasting with the purple. Here it is with a pastel and then you've got like a hot pink back here. No right or wrong, all same light characteristics. It's just whatever combination you choose. You mentioned this. You talked about this beautiful pink plant that's right here. Yeah, I have to laugh because people love bougainvillea and it's kind of like what I call a cruise ship plant because people see them when they go on cruises or they're in Mexico. And bougainvilleas come in multiple colors. 
And a lot of times people will go, oh, I want an orange or I want a yellow or I want a cream. But what we have found is the darker the color or the more fluorescent the color, the better they travel in shipping and the better they perform with our fluctuating temperatures during the season. And the, the bougainvilleas that we sell, we like to get the ones that don't have the big thorns on them. But again, the hotter we get, the more these bloom and go to town. And you can see here that they just are loaded with flowers. One variety that we sell, and it's not in the garden, is Purple Queen, and it's like Minnesota Viking Purple. I mean, it is so purple. And a trick with bougainvilleas is when they start to slow down in flowering, if you hit them with a little bit of light acid in your fertilizer, it brings them back really quick. The cool thing about a bougainvillea that people sometimes don't realize is that the, the bracts start out really small, and then eventually they color up. And it's almost, they almost feel like origami, where they have that really light touch to them. Yes. But they're beautiful, beautiful. And then do these bloom all summer? You know, once we get hot, they will keep going. But if we have a cool, wet season, then you'll have a tendency where they might slow down a little bit. But if it's super hot baking, that's when they look the best. Wow, these have been just beautiful plants that we've talked about. Can we go and look at some more? Oh yes, there's some great plants here in the garden. Mary, these are some of my ultimate favorites for the garden. And these are cannas. And these aren't your grandma's cannas. These are cannas. It's a, it's a program that's developed by Anthony Tesler. And these you cannot buy mail order. You have to buy them already started in a container. They come in a couple different colors. There's the regular Tropicana. This is Tropicana Gold. And then there's a Tropicana Black. What I love about these cannas is if you look at the way that the light hits the foliage, I mean, it's almost like stained glass in the garden. And cannas are multi-use. They could be put in a hot, sunny spot, or you could plunk them in your water garden. They can go either way. They get these really pretty um, sulfury colored flowers. And what's nice is when a stem gets big and loppy, I just come in and chop it off. And then you just let it keep going again. And these will go all the way until the frost. And then cannas are a plant that love to love you back. So if you are someone who likes to try to overwinter your tropicals, these, you just dry the tubers out in the fall, store them, and you have more cannas for next year and for your neighbors. So you can actually dig the tubers mm -hmm. and then let them dry. Yep. And then do you store them in a cool, dry place yep. over the winter? Yeah, my grandma used to put them in like a, uh, like a paper sack or else you could actually put them in, you know, leave them in the container in the soil and just kind of let it dry down. And, you know, one plant by the end of the season is going to have a root mass on it like this. So it's going to be something that you'll have much more of in the fall season. But I love these cannas. So these aren't grown from seed, but they will form a tuber that yes. you can keep from year to year. Yep, if you would like. Well, and the foliage is absolutely stunning. Oh, I love them. I, I absolutely love them. And the Tropicana is my favorite, but the gold, I mean, look at how it contrasts with the colors. It's so pretty. Mm. And this too blooms all summer long? It blooms all summer long, but this is more for foliage than it is for flower. This is kind of an added bonus that you get. You're basically growing it for this big strappy foliage. Well, it sure is showy. And this is, again, uh, I would think a plant that you could use at a golf course or a uh, some place where you need a lot of show in your yard, too. And a lot of neglect. <laughs> because these do well. You see these a lot like in bank plantings or fast food drive ups or in containers along city streets. Because cannas are one that will take it a little on the dry side. They can also take it on the wet side. And in a hot, sunny spot, they just thrive. And the wind really does not shred the foliage on them. Okay, what else do we have here that looks so pretty? Well, you mentioned that your favorite color is blue. And so I thought a fun plant that we could talk about that people sometimes aren't too familiar with is plumbago. And plumbago gives you this really pretty sky blue flower, almost like a periwinkle blue. And plumbago can be multiple use. It can be grown as a vine. I sometimes see them where people sell them as a hanging basket, or you can put them in the ground and let them run. The funny thing about plumbago is that as the flowers start to open up, they get like the sappy little dew on them, and then the blooms come out. So sometimes the blooms are stuck all over. We had a plumbago a year ago, and every time our cat would come in from the deck, he was covered with blue plumbago flowers <laughs> because they would, they would all stick to his fur. But you cannot find a tropical that will give you those types of colors. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the hotter it is, the more they bloom and bloom. And there's certain tropicals that will last even a little bit longer than the 40 degree cutoff temperature. And plumbago will take some chill. So it can still th be throwing flowers out there for you at the end of the season. I'm surprised that this isn't as fragrant as some of the others are. No, it's so crazy because you would look at it and think it would smell like baby powder or something. And it has no smell.
but it is absolutely a beautiful color for it's kind of a trade-off with tropicals you either get beautiful foliage and little flower or you get beautiful flowers and little foliage or you get big flowers not a lot of scent or little flowers like a gardenia but lots of scent so you got to kind of trade trade off but it sounds like there's something for everybody. There's something so, for everyone. Yes, you bet. Okay, what's the next one? Well, I think when this is another really cool one, and it's Ostromerias. And when we think of Ostromerias, I mean, we've all been to a wedding or had to use Ostromeria flowers in bouquets, corsages, or we've received flowers that have Ostromerias. And we sell them in little bitty two-gallon containers so someone can put them in a planter, all a rainbow of colors. And again, I mean, you can have flowers like this all summer long. These are just a really pretty contrast to add in the garden. I have a question. What do you recommend for a low maintenance fruit tree? You know, what I would recommend would be the alderman plum. Many people are familiar with the University of Minnesota apple breeding program, the Harrelson region, Fireside, Honeycrisp, but they may not be aware of the plum trees. And apples are great plants to grow. They require more skill and they have a lot more pest problems. Alderman plum is a terrific plum. It's ripe right now here, middle to the end of August. Big red plum with bright yellow flesh. It's sweet and juicy. It's actually better than most of the plums you can buy in the grocery store. The tree is right behind me. It's a tree that establishes quickly. You can plant a small bare root tree. It'll grow two feet plus a year. Uh, this tree is about 15 to 18 years old behind me, so that's getting close to mature height, maybe 25 feet. But they're also a beautiful tree in the spring. They have beautiful white flowers. They do require cross-pollination, so you either have to have another plum, Toka, which was developed in South Dakota, is a really good plum that'll cross-pollinate. Also the wild plum. A lot of people have wild plum on the edges of their pastures and things like that, or roadsides. That'll also pollinate this plant. Very few pest problems, great tasting plant. Everybody's interested in edible landscaping now, so it's really a good combination, attractive ornamental with white flowers and attractive leaves, and then uh, beautiful, uh, tasty fruit in August. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. What is this beautiful plant that we're standing by here? Okay, well this is a banana and this is the jewel of the garden. There's two types of bananas. There's incentis, which are just foliage, and there's musas, which produce fruit. Now, if you want a banana, you might as well just go to the grocery store and buy it, because you're never going to get one off of these plants. What these are grown for is this big, exotic, tropical foliage. Now, to give you an idea of how fast and how the, quick this plant changes, when we shipped this plant to the Morris Trial Garden this spring, it was probably 24 inches tall. So now, by, by the time it comes fall, this plant will probably be five to six feet tall. I make sure every year I have one of these in my yard and I plant it in the ground and just let it go because where can you get texture and color like this? The one thing about bananas though is the wind will kind of sometimes tear the foliage. So what I found as a trick is if you leave some of the lower leaves on when they get a little ratty and torn back, it helps to prevent the foliage, you know, protect the foliage going up. But it's a must, must, must for the garden. I love these. This is absolutely beautiful, and you're right, because I'm about a little over five <laughs> feet, and it is as tall as I am, yep. and, and so striking and stunning. Another must for the garden is, I think people know about tropicals, and they know about vines, and one vine is mandevilla or diplodenia. You know, what, it, what is it? And what's great about mandevillas is that they bloom like crazy, and they vine, like we have one that's covering the trellis over there. It could cover a chain link fence in a backyard. If you have a spot that maybe you don't want to see a neighbor, you want some privacy, you could let these mandevillas take over. And they come in different colors, red, pink. There's a, a type of a yellow, white. When we ship them, they come on kind of like a tripod. And that's just kind of to help keep them going. And then once you plant them, you can cut those ties off and then let that plant just go to town. They're beautiful, full sun, they love the sun. Okay, so another one for a lot of sun then. Another one that takes lots of sun and takes some neglect. It's one that you can kind of forget is there and all of a sudden you turn around one day and your fence is covered with flowers. And it's so beautiful too, it's almost fluorescent. Well, it's like, it's like you know how when you always look at flower colors, you go, oh, I'd love a dress that color. It's one of those. And then here's a plant that has such beautiful texture too. What is this? Well, that's the part of, about us here in Minnesota where we're, you know, true zone four, zone three. You get into some more urban settings like, you know, the middle of Minneapolis 
where maybe you could use some zone 5 plants. And Japanese maples are a plant that in Des Moines, Iowa or Omaha, they will winter. But for us up here where we get those drops in temperature during the winter months, they're not really winter hardy for us. But you can use them in, your, in the ground or in containers in more of a shady spot. So they're a great thing, a great plant to give you texture and brighten up a spot in a shady situation. You can overwinter these if you do kind of like the tree rose tip that people talk about where you, you know, dip them over. But the thing with any plant that's hardy that you put in containers, you want to make sure that you um, let that plant go back in the ground during the winter months. Because what happens is if that plant is, a, the root is exposed above ground, then that plant, the hardiness changes on that plant so they won't always come through. So it's important that hardy plants that you put in containers got to get back in the ground before the winter months. I know another plant and probably one of the best known plants that's considered a tropical is a hibiscus. Oh yes. And um, so tell us a little bit about those though I think a lot of our uh, viewers are, will be more familiar with a hibiscus. I think when people think of a tropical plant the first plant that comes to mind is mandevilla or hibiscus. And the hibiscus are a plant that are available everywhere. And they come in double, double flowers, single flowers, orange, reds, bicolors. And we talked a little bit earlier about sometimes you sacrifice one for the other. And it's the same with hibiscus. Hibiscus, sometimes you'll get the big single flowers that people go, oh, I've had that one before. But those are sometimes the ones that bloom the best. Then now they have these new hybrid ones where they're multiple colors, double colors. Those sometimes don't bloom as much but they have these striking, beautiful flowers. Hibiscus are, you know, a plant that love to give you enjoyment on your deck, but it is a plant that has a susceptibility to getting spider mites. And sometimes the easiest thing to do on these tropical plants is, as you're watering your plants, wash off the foliage. And sometimes you can do a lot of preventative for bugs and pests just by giving them a shower without using chemicals. Well, Suzette, thank you so much for coming and uh uh, telling us about all of these plants and where can people see these uh, these samples here that you've been showing us? Oh well there's a real jewel in Morris, Minnesota from I left Minneapolis this morning within two hours I was here and it's here at the Morris Trial Garden and we donate plants to them every year and it's a great way for the public to see the different varieties they plant them out here and just let mother nature take its course with an extra little TLC and it shows you what they can do in your garden with just a little care and maintenance. So this is the West Central Research and Outreach Center, which is a part of the University of Minnesota. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming out and telling us about these great plants and all these new options that people have available. Yep, it gives it's more gardening opportunities for those of us that are zonally challenged. Thank you. You're welcome. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org.